So tonight I'd like to welcome you all to Birding Hotspots, a bird finding guide for the eBird age. We have three speakers that are going to speak all about this tonight. And I will introduce Chuck Hundermark, our CFO president, and he will introduce the rest of the speakers. Um, CFO's interest in birds developed in junior high and took over as he was finishing undergraduate work at the University of Pennsylvania. He's a past president of the Albuquerque Audubon, New Mexico Ornithological Society, and Denver Field Ornithologists, as well as a past board chair of Rocky Mountain Bird Observatory, which is now Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. Um, he's published papers in ornithology and taught numerous bird identification and behavior classes. He's worked multiple blocks for the second Colorado Breeding Bird Atlas and has authored several species accounts. More recently, he did field work for the Maine Breeding Bird Atlas. And as I already mentioned, he's the current president of Colorado Field Ornithologists, and I very much enjoyed working alongside of him these last few years. With that, I'm gonna turn this over to Chuck and the rest of the speakers. Thank you, Megan. And uh, I'm gonna take a second here to share my screen, if I may. Uh-oh, it wants me to sign in. <laughs> yeah. Uh-oh, and it doesn't accept my sign in. This is a problem. You're on your, we're on your screen. Yeah, we can see your screen oh, and the okay, good. presentation. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, it was, okay. So um, it, uh, it's a delight to me to be here with you this evening uh, and with Ann Johnson and Ken Ostermiller to talk about birding hotspots. Uh, this is a new website that, as you will see as we move through this, is actually what I consider the new bird finding guide for the eBird age. Ann Johnson uh, made the Pileated woodpecker, her first bird, the first bird on her life list when she was the ripe old age of seven. And uh, she has, uh, that's become a hobby that's brought her immense happiness and, and, and adventure for many years. At the age of 12, she became the youngest member of the Iowa Ornithologic, Ornithologists Union, and the rest is history. In 1995, combining her interests in birding and technology, she developed the first IOU web presence. She then became the Iowa Records Committee Secretary in 2000, which expanded into the development of a web applications for birding businesses, allowing birders to interactively report their rarities and seasonal significance, seasonally, seasonal significance sightings electronically. Word of mouth eventually led to involvement with other natural history organizations. She is involved with Colorado field ornithologists since 2013, uh, as a website developer. Uh, she retired from state government as a child welfare management analyst and has devoted her time to bringing together the analysis, organizational knowledge, and programming skills for the benefit of birders everywhere. Uh, Anne is the one who introduced me to Birding Hotspots website, where I had the chance to meet Ken Ostermiller. And Ken, who's the founder of Birding Hotspots, enjoys bird watching and remembers his first bird identification. He was seven years old, and that was a yellow shafted flicker. Now, of course, lumped together with red shafted as part of, as the Northern flicker. He enjoys observing common birds in an area as much as seeking rare birds. As a volunteer, he, he reviews, as a volunteer, he reviews, uh, sorry, I got distracted by a phone call. <laughs> he reviews suggestions for bird reporting hotspots for eBird, a real-time online checklist program launched in 2002 by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and the National Audubon Society. Ken is a retired educator and United Church of Christ minister, likes having time in retirement to follow his interest in birds. And we'll see what that led to as we move through our program this evening. So... In uh, back in 1934, ever since 1934, when Roger Tory Peterson launched his published his first birding guide, field guide 
to birds of Eastern North America, we birders have been keeping life lists and checklists. Initially, we kept those checklists in paper records. And then as we moved into the electronic wor world, uh, it became electronic databases. But in 2002, eBird launched, or Cornell Lab launched eBird, which allows us to keep our checklists online. And it slices and dices those checklists any way we want to. We keep our eBird lists on, or checklists on eBird. We can find out what our life list is in the world, in the country, in the state, in a county, or anywhere else you want to. And eBird checklists are documented are, ah, that's not working, are, are uh, recorded for hotspots. We can have personal hotspots, or as this map reflects, we can have public hotspots. Public hotspots can be seen by any birder who signed on to, uh, to eBird. And uh, it allows us to, to see what birds are being found at any of these public hotspots around the state, around the country, and around the world. But in the 1940s, another ornithologist, Olin Sewell Pettengill, was uh, looking for directions to get to Hawk Mountain Sanctuary, a very popular hawk watching site in Pennsylvania. And so he consulted a friend for directions to get there and was delighted with uh, the experience afterwards. And he began thinking, you know, we have field guides to the birds. Why don't we have a field guide to bird finding? to show us locations where we can find birds of interest. And so Pettengill developed uh, first an Eastern, a guide to the, a bird finding guide to birds east of the Mississippi, and then to sites west of the Mississippi. And in these field guides, he described the location, the locations where you might find interesting birds uh, in any state in the country and directions for how to get there, ideas for what birds you might find there. Eventually, that evolved into a series of regional guides where there's even more information available on how to bird different locations around the country. You wanna to go to the Texas Gulf Coast, there's a Lane Regional Guide for that. These guides came out in the 70s and 80s and were very popular. Same time, uh, a lot of states, uh, birders or field ornithologists in those states were developing guides to birding locations in those states to help us find the interesting spots uh, to find, for, for example, the burrowing owl. And those were very popular. Concurrently with that, many states developed birding trail dialogues uh, or books. Now, these were books and then ultimately websites where you could uh, find a route around a different, different parts of a state to find good birding locations. Come the early part of this century, uh, a group of birders in Colorado and our, at that time, website developer, Ann Johnson, thought that it might be nice to develop this kind of a guide for Colorado. And so ultimately the Colorado field ornithologist county birding website was developed. And that site provides directions to interesting bird spots in every county in Colorado. And you can find details on how to get there, what kind of habitats you might find, any interesting tips about those birding locations. And so now I wanna let Ann pick up this story. I'm gonna turn this over to Ann because she was the key person uh, putting this all together on the CFO website. Ann, I'm going to kick yeah. it over to you. Okay, there we are. Got my screen? Yes, we can see it. Okay. So just um, we're going to talk a little bit now about the evolution of online resources for birders because it really has changed since the late 90s. 
And I don't know if you all remember this. This is the first snapshot I found of the original CFO website. And this snapshot is from the year 2000. And it was basically as state organizations tried to get into the whole web presence thing, it was putting up some information online that people could access via the internet. Now, this was probably an old 14.4 modem or something, dial up access and whatnot. So there wasn't a whole lot of interactivity there. And it was basically just static pages of information. Then somewhere in the 2000s, these different state organizations thought it would be good to put information up about how to find different birding locations in their states. And you can see from this slide, there are a lot of different ways that happened. And actually, Colorado's first, uh, first website for county birding was like this one photo right here in the center. And it was basically just a page for each county with all of the uh, different, I always do that. I told those guys I needed to stay off my mouse. <laughs> um, and it was really just a list of, uh, of information on best places to bird in each county. Now, over on the left, you'll see what Oklahoma did. They had a hard copy guide to birding Oklahoma. And somebody sat down and typed all of that up, and they put it all in their website page by page. Uh, Missouri, up there at the top, did a bunch of PDFs on their conservation areas and their state parks and state historical sites and just made those PDFs available for different sites. And then Iowa, this was our first attempt at it. Um, and it was really just a gazetteer of how do I find places? People were posting on the listserv about, found a short-billed gull at Pinchy Bottoms. And somebody says, how do you find that place? And so we created this little database-driven system of uh, directions of how to get there. So there were all sorts of different methods that people were using to try to get the bird finding information out there. By the 2010s, we had two really significant events. One is that states were starting to create more database-driven applications for capturing data and integrating things from different sources. And that's when I got involved with CFO because I had just created the CBRC site for the records committee and we could use some of the same data and provide more information on the county birding site by including um, CBRC accepted records for each county and the different tables could talk to each other and different applications could talk to each other. The other part of that was the growth of eBird. And it really started taking off in the teens. And they started making more data available. So then we could start integrating county birding with um, some of the recent eBird sightings. And what is the CRBC? Colorado Rare Birds Committee. Yeah. Got to stop and think a minute. I think that's right, isn't it? Colorado Bird Records Committee. Records Committee. Okay. Different states call them different things, but I got to stop and think. So it's where people submit documentations of rare birds. Okay, so this was the original rendition Somewhere 2007 or maybe even a little earlier than that, we had the static pages for each county with locations. Then that was taken into a database-driven system. And now this was the first one that I ever did was in 2013. Now 
And then in 2020, we upgraded again to make it more closely match your uh, main site. And it's now even more fully integrated with eBird. But the problem is some of the content was nearly 20 years old by now. And the time and the interest in maintaining that content really got pretty limited. So we've got some challenges now. You know, the organizational volunteer time and commitment to keep content current. And some of it's more than a decade old. So that's an issue. We have separate and distinct websites for each state and province, and those require significant searching when you're traveling. And as a traveler, trust me, that's a that's an issue. It's not very convenient. And there was some manual mapping back and forth between eBird and all of these different state slides. So we have a real power of a new application called Birding Hotspots. I first learned about this about a year ago now. I was getting ready to go to Phoenix, go down and see my kid, and just to happen to bump into some information about this. And so I chatted with Ken a little bit, and he gave me editor permissions for Arizona so I could kind of play around while I was down there. And so I went out a few days, took some photos and added some information. And I was really sold on the, what the power was. It can, it networks all of the different eBird hotspots all over the world eventually. Um, it identifies a larger number of good birding locations or at least accessible birding locations then any one state could conjure up with just a small group of people it allows all people all birders to participate in keeping things current and being helpful to others it really lessens the demand for volunteer time from organizations which is a big plus we all had good intentions when we started but we know how that goes. And then it easily integrates into other organizational resources to, to enhance educational goals. So this is what it looks like. It looks the same. But the old site has of like two weeks ago or so had 959 sites on it. Your birding in Colorado site now has 3,558 3, sites the last I looked. So you're now connected to all of the eBird hotspots in Colorado. So the look has remained constant, but the volume of information available has increased exponentially. So this is what the old Walden Ponds, Sawhill Ponds complex looked like on the old site on the left, which was, you know, okay. It shows it's an eBird hotspot. It has a handicapped accessibility icon, a little bit of description there, the habitat, directions. Then we've brought in the CBRC records from there. Um, it has the eBird seasonal bar chart. It would have uh, recent rare bird sightings if there were any. But on the right side is what we get with the same stuff on birding hotspots. We now have it illustrated. We have a nice map. And then all of the information down there we've imported from what's on your left there. We took the the description and the directions and imported them into birding hotspots. So, how can you help? We're going to let Ken walk through 
how birding hotspots works and then talk a little bit about how each of you can become a part of this big project. And it is a big project and and it's one that is never done, I think, because people suggest new hotspots all the time. I thought I had a county in Iowa done last summer and there's two more hotspots to it now. So with that, Ken, I'm going to stop sharing and turn it over to you. Thank you, Ann. And while Ken is getting set up there to share, um, let me just say that um, uh, Ken will welcome, uh, if you want to put questions in the chat as we're going through, you're welcome to do that. We'll be looking at those and uh, we'll feed them to Ken uh, as appropriate. Okay, thanks, Chuck and Ann. Yes, uh, feel free to uh, put your questions in as we go along. Uh, and thanks for that introduction to this. I hope that Burning Hotspots really does live up to these hopes that both Chuck and, and Ann have for it. Uh, this is the Burning Hotspots website. It's birdinghotspots.org. Uh, we currently have uh, information about the hotspots in 36 of the U.S. states um, and two provinces in Canada, one state in Mexico, and four uh, international locations. We have the capability of describing hotspots anywhere in the world. Uh, we'll see where this goes in the future. It's all in a database. Uh, eBird's interested in what we're doing. We don't know where this will end up in, in, the, uh, in the future, but it's certainly been quite a ride uh, developing this. Uh, the landing pages for birding hotspots are all fairly uh, similarly organized. Uh, we usually show uh, some kind of a uh, display of the um, some of the hotspots. Uh, this is a, a rotating display that uh, just shows some sample hotspots. Uh, there's always more information available. Uh, and I wanted to show you how many people are involved in helping us uh, develop this site. Uh, we have currently uh, over a hundred volunteer editors who are uh, helping us by um, processing suggestions that birders make. This is a crowdsourced site, so birders can uh, submit photos or add to the descriptions of the site. Those uh, can't be added directly. An editor needs to look at them. Uh, and these editors are also entering information themselves about uh, hotspots. You can see we've got a few people involved in Colorado in uh, adding information. And uh, we actually need more. We'd like to get more counties covered. Um, I'm going to go up now and switch to the United States map. You can navigate uh, within the site quite easily. If you'll uh, click on birding hotspots, it'll take you always back to the main page. Uh, and then you can click on uh, any of these to go to a state page. But let's look at the United States page right first. Uh, this is a map of the US showing uh, the states in darker gray. We have a section open for those states. Uh, the states that are grayed out, uh, we don't yet have someone. We're willing to open a new section when I get a volunteer who's willing to process suggestions from birders and begin working on adding information. Uh, we're constantly adding to this. We just added New York uh, this last week. Uh, you can see these states have uh, over 100,000 eBird hotspots, we've got information on about a quarter of them. So there's still a lot that we need to add uh, to make this site uh, more useful. Uh, we've got a few states. Uh, Ohio, where I started this project, has all of its hotspots described. 
And I, I currently live in Vermont, so I have a personal interest in uh, the uh, New England area. So we've got all the New England uh, paid uh, hotspots pretty much described. There are a few that we're still still working on. Um, let's take, oh, one of the things that, that I wanna tell you, the navigation on these uh, regional pages is all similar. Uh, there's a link here that'll give you different ways to find hotspots. And I'll look at some of these more specifically when we get to the Colorado page. Um, and then there are links back to the back to eBird. You can get an illustrated checklist of birds for the region that you're looking at. Uh, and these three dots uh, bring down a, a drop down menu of other ways you can connect uh, to eBird. You can look at the, the eBird hotspot maps. You can look at recent visits. We uh, build bar charts for you. Um, and uh, uh, we've also got a, a, a link if you're logged into your eBird account, you can see your life list uh, or year list for this particular uh, region. In this case, it would be for the whole US. I'm not gonna click on those because they take a little time to load. We'll look at it when we get to, the, to, to Colorado. Uh, and let's go there. And you can, if, if there's a map, you can click on uh, the, the image on the map. Or if you don't know where uh, a region is, like a county or a state, uh, you can change it to a list. Uh, so let's go to Colorado. Uh, this is the Colorado landing page. And again, uh, the navigation tools are very similar to what I just showed you. Uh, there are different ways to find hotspots. Uh, you can get an illustrated checklist or you can uh, get a, you can get links back to eBird. Uh, I'll show you my life list for eBird. We, we've been to Colorado just a few times, so I'm, I don't have as many species in, in your state as, uh, as most of you do, but um, sometimes I want to know, well, what did I see? And uh, uh, it, the, our website gives you uh, a, a quick way uh, to do that. Um, you can also switch this to the county li name list if that's easier for you to navigate to a county page. Um, and uh, the county pages look similar. We'll, we can take a look at that uh, if we have time. I, I, I could probably keep us going till midnight describing this. So I'm trying not to take uh, too, too long uh, with this. You'll see that um, with uh, in Colorado, you've got uh, 3,500 plus hotspots, and uh, we haven't got quite half of them uh, described yet. So there's more, more work to be done, uh, and we hope some of you would be willing uh, to help us uh, with this project. Uh, the, on the state page, you have a display of the top hotspots. These are the, um, this display is organized by the hotspots that have the most um, species reported. We're gonna take a look at Bar Lake uh, in, a, in a few minutes. Um, the, we also have uh, some links to uh, birding organizations, whoops. Uh, and to, I'm sorry, we're, it's, my mouse is clicking on things and it's doing just what yours did. <laughs> uh, uh, you, you can see these are live links. You can go to uh, the web page about uh, all these groups. We also have uh, our, the capability of creating uh, pages about a group of hotspots like Rocky Mountain National Park or a national monument, a state park. Um, and we'll take a look at an example of a group uh, at Bar Lake uh, when, when we get there. 
Um, birders who've been helping us have asked us to add this little section to the uh, to the state and county pages. They were saying, well, help us know which hotspots you need help with. So uh, here are, if you've got uh, images and you want to know what pages need images, you can click on this and uh, and see which, uh, uh, like I'll, I'll open that one for you. So the, these are these are all hotspots where we need content, and uh, uh, you you will show you how you can help help with that uh, in, in in a few minutes. And finally, at the bottom of each of our regional pages, uh, we've got what in, in in Ohio has been one of the reasons people come and use this site regularly. Uh, we've got a list of the notable sightings. These are birds reported to eBird in the last three days that are either rare or unusual for the season. And uh, you can, uh, this is really handy if you can, if you'll open this website in the browser on your smartphone while you're traveling and you want to know, let's see if we can, uh, you, you can show the actual checklist where this bird was reported. And if you wanna get directions to it, click on directions, it opens Google Maps, and then you can use directions to uh, navigate to the hotspot uh, on, on your phone uh, when you're traveling. Of course, you have to have cell service for that to work, but it's really handy. Uh, when when it when you use it, uh, that works in uh, for from the hotspot pages too, and I'll show you show you that. Um, another uh, one of the ways that you can uh, look at hotspots, uh, we've got several ways you can do that. Uh, one thing we track is uh, whether you can. Uh, view birds from your vehicle. There's some birders with uh, uh, mobility challenges who bird basically from their vehicle. And uh, this uh, is a list of places where you can view birds either from the roadside or a, a parking area. Uh, we're tracking whether there is a wheelchair accessible uh, trail at the, uh, uh, at the location. The BirdAbility uh, website is tracking uh, many additional accessibility features. We're just tracking this one for right now um, and maybe could end up doing more with that. Uh, if you want to know which are the group locations, you can click here. And this is something that you can't get from eBird. Um, if you're interested in uh, birding around a a, uh, a community, let's say you're traveling to Boulder, uh, we're showing you uh, all the hot spots in a five mile radius of, the, of a community center. And uh, they're coded, uh, the, the, the redder, <laughs> the hotter the hot spot looks, the more species there are uh, at that hot spot. And uh, we've also got them then listed by um, the top ones by the, in terms of the number of species. So if you were visiting Boulder, probably these are the hot spots you might want to consider uh, visiting. Uh, we've got that, that kind of uh, uh, parsing of the hot spots set up for all the late the locations that we have we have open and uh, it's a, it's a it's a very handy tool to use uh, when you're when you're traveling well that's a quick tour of the colorado page uh, chuck or ann is there anything you either of you wanted to say about this or are there any questions that people have posted haven't seen any yet I don't see any questions, Ken, but uh, yeah, so I just mentioned that, you know, so this is, there are two ways I think that our uh, our, our 
participants can can use this. One is as a bird finding tool when you're looking for burning hotspots yourself. And the other one is um, sharing information that you get about these hotspots by submitting suggestions that will help us to build out the website. And I think that's a key point uh, that we'd like to encourage people to do. But the first step is to try it out yourself when you're looking for uh, some interesting birding spots to get out there and give it a try. But can well, let's, yeah, let's, how that would work. Let's take let's take a look at uh, at a particular hot spot. Um, Bar Lake State Park uh, is the hot spot in the state that has the most species. We're going to take a look at that. And I could click here on this icon and go to that uh, that hot spot. Um, however, I wanted to show you one thing that's kind of a, a hidden feature here. If you want to find a hot spot, this little uh, search icon up here pops up a uh, a field, and you can enter all or part of the name of a hot spot, and it will show you uh, if there's a group for it or the individual hot spots within uh, uh, that group. So let's take a look at Bar Lake. I'll go to, to it from this link. Uh, this is how the, the uh, uh, a hotspot page is organized throughout the site. If we have a photo uh, uh, of the habitat uh, of the location, we use it as a banner photo. Uh, for Bar Lake, we've just got one photo, but if we had more than one, uh, you can actually scroll through this, uh, through them uh, in, the, as, in a gallery uh, kind of style. Um, and then uh, we have this, the navigation uh, uh, tools back to eBird. So, there are 350 species uh, reported here at Bar Lake. And if you wanna see what there are, you can click there and it opens uh, the eBird page that uh, sh shows you when, uh, what birds were, and this is sorted by last seen. Uh, so you can see, uh, and this is on every page, whether we've added additional content or not. So there, there is content about uh, each uh, hotspot already up here uh, in the, with links back to eBird. You can also get directions uh, to the site, uh, like I showed you before. Uh, now, it happens here that uh, this hotspot is located in the middle of the lake, so you'll have to adjust if you do get directions to it, you're going to have to adjust where you go. But um, uh, this is a very handy uh, link, uh, particularly if, if you're traveling. Uh, can, can, I inter can I interrupt sure. you a second? Sure. Because I think this is a prime example of why this application is so powerful because eBird hotspots often are just plunked in the center of a big area. And by giving directions and giving some description, it's a whole lot easier to find where to even drive to, where to park. You know, that's the that's the beauty of all of this. Yeah, and you, you'll see in a minute that uh, we also have information about the other hotspots in this uh... Uh, at Bar Lake, and uh, actually the that uh, mapping will work better uh, at some of those individual hotspots. Um, we also have uh, links right here at the top of the page where you can uh, add information for us. You can upload photos or suggest edits, and we're we're going to explore how you do that uh, in a bit. Uh, we've got a section where we tell you where the hotspot is and uh, provide links uh, to the websites about the hotspot so you don't have to go searching for them. Uh, if you want to if you want to download the park map, you can do it from this link. Um, and uh, we also display the park map uh, here uh, on this page. Uh, you can click it 
make it bigger. Uh, uh, we also have a map that you can zoom in on or out of. Uh, it's an interactive map. Uh, and then we're collecting four types of information about uh, each hotspot. Uh, we're asking for tips for birding. Where where do you park? What uh, uh, what time of year is good to go there? Uh, uh, this is uh, information from people who have visited the spot and. Uh, uh, often we don't have these tips for birding. It's been easy for us to find out a description of the location, but uh, this is where you can add to a page where maybe there's just this about the location information, but we don't have tips. Uh, we also are interested in listing birds of interest. What, what birds uh, would you go to this park because you can find them there and they're hard, maybe hard to find uh, other places? Uh, what, what birds are of interest uh, to, to, to visitors? Um, we have uh, information about the location. In this case, we've also got uh, information from the um, group page about the, uh, the park generally, and then some specific information about this location uh, within the park. And then our fourth uh, area is notable trails, just, uh, some description of uh, where you hike. And that's often birders want uh, information about, well, where can I go in the park? And uh, we try to provide that. We're also tracking four kinds of features. Three of them are described here. We track whether or not there are restrooms at the site, whether there's a wheelchair accessible trail, <clears throat> and whether or not there's an entrance fee. Our fourth category is that roadside birding. And in this case, you notice because the arc is in, oops, excuse me, in the, stop that, in the middle of the lake, uh, that's not quite so good for roadside birding. So we, we've left it blank here on this page. We're not, this, we're not saying you, you probably you can do roadside birding uh, in the roads on the park. So we're not saying this is the greatest spot place to do that. But if it's a good place for roadside birding, we'll display an, an icon there for that. Um, I, and uh, somebody has asked, um, uh, who decides on what's a birding hotspot? Uh, We're uh, letting eBird decide that. So you've got a hotspot uh, reviewer in uh, probably several people are doing uh, reviewing hotspots in, in Colorado. And uh, those are in eBird, hotspot is kind of a misnomer in a way. Uh, the These are birding locations, uh, most of which are public, uh, where birders can share their, um, uh, can, it's a shared birding reporting location. Uh, the hot, some hot spots are hotter than others. And uh, we display that and the eBird does too by color. So a hot spot that's uh, uh, closer to red color is gonna have more species at it. But you know, almost any location, the public location where you can go over the course of a couple years, people birding it, you're certainly gonna get over a hundred species that uh, you'll see there. Uh, it took me, I think three years to get that many at my home in Ohio, but I finally did get, <laughs> get that many. So we use the eBird hotspots and uh, this website automatically creates a page for any new hotspot. It searches the eBird database uh, every 24 to 48 hours. And if there's a new hotspot, it's automatically added to the page. And Ann just told you she had a, a county where she thought she had it all caught up and 
the eBird uh, folks added a couple hotspots. So she had two more hotspots uh, to describe to keep that going. Well, let's take a look at uh, the group page for Bar Lake State Park. It's organized just a little differently. Um, we list the, the primary location and the sub-locations in the park. Um, and we also on the map box now have uh, a, a display of where the hotspots are, are located. So uh, if you decided, for example, you wanted to go here to Bird, uh, I could click here to view that page. I can also click here to get the Google map back. And we could probably navigate to that more easily than we can to the middle, middle of the lake. Um, and we have, we've collected the same information. We haven't added a section on trails here. Uh, might be worth uh, considering our adding something about the trails even on this, uh, uh, on this page. Um, the, one of the reasons we created the group page is we discovered we almost always wanted to say something about the park generally. And this information in about this location is just automatically transferred to all the uh, sub-location pages. And then we only have to edit it one place if it changes. And the park map is automatically added to the sub-location pages. Um, you know, I notice here, we've got uh, a page, uh, one of these hotspots we don't have a photo of. Um, Ann, didn't you tell me you've got a photo of this page? Yeah, thanks to Chuck. Well, um, would you be willing to show them how to uh, how to add that? Sure. Okay, let me stop sharing. How do I do that? Oh, there it is. All right, show us how to do that. Oh, okay. Oh. Let's see, I got to get back to... I got to find my browser here. <laughs> Somewhere I've got a browser open. You think I have enough open on my desktop? You've, you've got plenty of pages open. Why can't I? There we go. Well, shoot. I've got a little thing up here that blocks my browser. And you should be able to move that to a lower portion of your screen. Yeah, it won't drag at all. I can get there from this way. Okay. Okay, so here we are. And I am going to, I'm going to do a couple things here. I'm going to upload a photo and I'm going to suggest an edit because there's a little typo right here. So the first thing I'm going to do is come down here. And I'm just going to type in raptors. And I'm going to submit that suggestion. And so now then an editor has received that suggestion. So now let's go in and upload a photo. 
And this is pretty straightforward. I can just drag the photo there. And the one thing I want to do here is I want to I want to change that mm -hmm. since normally I'd be submitting my photos, but I want to give Chuck attribution for this one. And so I've now uploaded it. I can put a caption on here if I want. And now I'm going to save it. And now that's complete. So now I'm going to stop sharing, Ken, and you can show them what happens after they submit. All righty. Uh, go back to sharing my screen. All right. Um, now I'm going to log into my editor account. And uh, let's go see if in my editor account, I see that uh, this has been suggested as a photo. So if I like it, I can uh, add it. So let's, uh, before I add it, let me show you the, uh, it's trying to tell me it can make Chrome faster. I was going to try to go to the view the hotspot. There we go. So you can see here there's no photo. I'm going to click approve and go back here and refresh the page. And the photo has been added. So it's really easy for the editor to do the, the photo uh, review. Um, now, Anne suggested an edit for this. So here, here is uh, that uh, pending suggestion. And I can say, oh, yeah, she, she, that's good. She corrected that. So I'm going to approve that. And you can see here it says it's approved. So I can go back here and let's refresh the page and see if indeed, uh, yeah, Raptors is now spelled correctly. Um, and what it's done here is it's added Anne as a contributor of information and she really just did a spelling correction. So Anne, I'm gonna, uh, take that attribution off of your page. This is... Uh, a, yep, that's a good idea. Uh, see, we can, uh, we can, we keep track of where we've gotten information, but since this was just a spelling uh, correction, we'll, we'll leave Paul and Chuck as the uh, main contributors uh, to this page. Uh, this is the editing environment that the, the editor has, and it, we have control over more fields like the address field and the the uh, uh, adding the links that 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 kind of thing. And then when we're done, we have to save it. And uh, will Ian get feedback on whether the suggestion and the photo were were accepted? Uh, currently, we don't do that unless the editor takes the time to email the person and tell them that. Uh, and I, in the uh, states where I'm doing editing, I try to do that when I have time. Uh, you know, these these editors are busy people, as all we all are, and. Uh, uh, Probably one way you can check is you can visit the page and see if your photo uh, has appeared yet. Uh, but sometimes it can take time because, as we say, we're 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 busy folk. But um, it's it, it's it's a way to uh, to get uh, information from birders into the site. Uh, one other uh, page that. Uh, we were interested in looking at 
Uh, Chuck, you wanted to say something about this page in Larimer County. Yeah, this is a good example of um, of how um, how you can help improve uh, what's on this site. And um, excuse me, uh, Ken, if you'll slide down and show us what's down at the uh, bottom of the page where it says about Timnath Reservoir. This information uh, where it says about Timnath Reservoir was uh, loaded over from the uh, county birding page in CFO. And so this information is a bit old. And just recently, I saw on CoBirds a posting by John Chenault, who's the president of Fort Collins Audubon Society. And can we scroll back up now? And John had provided some information to co-birders about current information on how you can access Timnath Reservoir, what the rules are, what the what the uh, restrictions are, because Timnath is a private reservoir, but there are public there are areas where the public can view it. And so I asked John to add this uh, to the website to update it, and he submitted this as a suggestion. I accepted it, and now there is current information about Timnath Reservoir, a very popular birding area in the Fort Collins area, uh, where you can uh, access that that uh, hotspot. So this is the kind of thing where birders can share information and improve the performance of uh, of birding hotspots website. Be useful, helpful to other birders. Great. There, there are several ways that uh, people could help us uh, with this. Let me get a, uh, hopefully get a slide up here. Come on here. Um, well, sorry, well, I guess we'll look at it that way. Can you see the how to help? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, Chuck, you want to talk a little bit about how people can help? Uh, looks like there are three ways here. Well, the first thing is to just uh, use the site, enjoy it, and find out how it's useful to you. And then as you get out there, um, you can submit suggestions and or photos. Uh, we need photos on a lot of the Colorado sites. They make it more inviting for birders to go there. It gives them an idea of what they can expect when they arrive there. Uh, so if you submit a photo, uh, an editor will review it. It'll be me or Kent or somebody else, and uh, we'll, we'll uh, accept that submission, and it will show up on the web page. And there will be credit uh, to you as the photographer. And then the other thing you can do is, uh, if the information is outdated, you can provide new information about that site, uh, interesting tips about the habitat, um, many other kinds of information, anything that you find you, you think would be useful to other birders. Uh, and the final step, uh, if you'd really like to uh, help out, uh, particularly in many of the uh, counties in the remoter parts of Colorado, the western counties, the mountain counties, uh, some of the far eastern plains, it would be helpful if we had more editors who are familiar with those counties so that they can review and perhaps even uh, provide information on their own. And you can uh, either just uh, request from Ken on the Burning Hotspot site permission to be an editor, or you can get in touch with me if you want to talk about it a little further. Um, you can reach me at presidentcobirds.org. I've got a couple comments to make, I think. One is that don't forget when you're in cell phone range, and I realize out in the mountains that isn't always true, but um, if you're in cell phone range, it's really easy when you're out birding to snap a picture or two of a site and upload it right on the spot. I learned how to do that this summer when I was traveling around Iowa, and I'd just hit a park and get a couple photos, bring up the site, upload them, and be done with it. So it can really be a pretty fast uh, process. And the other thing that I was just thinking as we were talking through all of this, I don't know about the rest of you, but I have a whole bookshelf full of old lane guides that have notes written in them as things have changed. 
uh, my first Arizona guide was so full of notes, I finally broke down and bought a new one. But, um, you know, this is an active application. So as things change, it doesn't take much to just update it right on the spot. And then everybody's got the newer information. So that's what the Internet's done for us. Ken, uh, somebody is asking, uh, Annette is asking, um, Antoinette, I'm sorry, is asking, are you actively reaching out to organizations in different states uh, to ask them to contribute, or is it just word of mouth? Yes, we, we actually uh, are getting, we've gotten uh, inquiries about several uh, additional states and countries. I've uh, been in a conversation with some folks in Brazil who'd like to get uh, Brazil added to the website. Um, and we're, we've been very fortunate to get uh, in touch with uh, some of the birding uh, ornithological societies um, across the state. And editors are tending to contact uh, Audubon societies often have for their particular smaller area of a state, some descriptions of hotspots. We're usually contacting those Audubon societies to see if, the, if we could uh, link to or uh, cut, move information uh, that they've got in, into the website. So it's a, it's a big process though, as I, as I showed you, I'm, uh, supporting about over a hundred editors right now. So it's a, it's a bit of a task to do that. Well, Ken and Anne and Chuck, I wanna thank you so much for presenting and teaching us all about this tonight and also for all of the work that you've put into this website. I think this is a great resource for us in Colorado and for us as we are traveling and going around to different places. So for everyone in the audience, um, feel free to put any other questions you have in the chat, or I will go ahead and allow people to unmute themselves to ask questions themselves. If you have any questions you would like to ask. While we're waiting for this, I would like to remind everyone that Colorado Field Ornithologists is a nonprofit and we are a volunteer run nonprofit supported by our memberships. So if you are not a member, consider becoming a member. And if you are a member, thank you very much for your ongoing support. Um, I am at this point not seeing any other questions in the chat. Would anybody like to unmute and ask any questions? I'm not seeing anything. Well, we must find have, comments from Ken, Ann, or Chuck? We, we must have explained it quite well, but thank you, everyone. The question just came in. Ah, somebody says, oh, Antoinette says, uh, such a great resource. I was in Hilton Head and met some people from their local Audubon recently. I'll send them a request to get South Carolina added. There you go, Ken. You got a recruit here. Yeah. yeah. You know, we, we I've need become... I've become such a big evangelist. I've hit up every state that I've done work for and then expanded beyond that. And sometimes I don't get responses from people. So if you know somebody in a local group, get them going. I've, I've had at least three people from uh, South Carolina uh, ask for a section to be open, but I haven't found anyone who's willing to volunteer to help us uh, uh, as an editor in the state. So uh, I, I I really, I can't, if I don't have an editor, I'm going to have to uh, process suggestions and I can't do that for the whole country. So uh, if, if you know someone in South Carolina who would be a good one to get the section open, have them contact me. We'd be glad to do that. <laughs> You know, some here's a question: What is the time commitment for an editor? And I should. I've recorded a few videos that I've used for different states that I'm working with on uh, 
how to contribute, how to um, how to be an editor, some of the minimal time requirements, and then more of the things that you can do. And I wonder if I can put it in the chat, if I can figure out how to do that here. That, that would be helpful. What I'm saying to, to people about this is one of the nice things about this project is that there are no deadlines and no minimum requirements. Uh, editors do what they can when they can. Uh, and we've got some editors who really don't have much time and that's fine if uh, they can just enter information about one or two places and vet the suggestions from the public, uh, that's fine. I've got some others who've spent a lot of time at this and uh, uh, it's up to you how much time you wanna give you give to it. Uh, but over, you know, a year or two, uh, you'd be surprised spending, a, you know, a few hours a week uh, working on this, how quickly you could get the hotspots filled out uh, uh, for a county. Uh, another question came in that says, are there any examples of what to say in each section? Uh, well, we have a tips for editors document that does uh, give suggestions about uh, how to how to format and what kinds of information we want in each of the sections, yes. And is that, you say it's a document, is that something that is sent to the editors when they, or is it available online for those to review? We we, we have a, an editor dashboard that, that documents available to them. It's a good suggestion though, maybe at some point I need to get a link, the tips for uh, birders about what to suggest uh, uh, in in those blocks. I yeah. we have not done that. That might be a good a good thing to add. <laughs> yes, please. Okay. <laughs> yes. I think what you'll find right now is we've just started rolling things that different states have had. There's it's kind of all over the place. Because we just started from where they were, and it'll evolve over time, I'm sure. Yeah, it's it's been an interesting process from from my standpoint. There are uh, quite a few things I would like the editors to do in terms of formatting, and uh, it's been very interesting to watch how different editors approach this a little bit differently than I would. And I'm having to get over that I don't have control over absolutely <laughs> everything. It's a, uh, it's a wonderful problem to have. <laughs> well, again, thank you very much, Ken and Chuck and Ann for the work on the program and the work on the, the website and everything going into it. And thank you all of you that joined us tonight to learn about it. And I hope you use the site for your own birding, you contribute to it, and you consider making edits, um, adding pictures, and possibly being an editor. Um, I don't see any other questions coming in, people thanking you, so thank you very much, and I hope you join us next month for our talk with Kyle Horton and migration. <laughs>